We're going to see our temples desecrated. We're going to see our churches taken over. We're going to see our 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 beloved apostles and prophets probably in hiding for a time because of all of the atrocities that will happen in this country and we will see the Antichrist in our country. But then we will see some miraculous events. Hello everyone. Welcome to this episode of the Spiritual Survival Podcast. I'm your host, Randy Brown. Our team's mission is to help you have eyes to see the times we are living in. Take unprecedented measures to prepare yourself spiritually for the events that will precede the second coming of Jesus Christ. Hello everyone. Welcome to this edition of Spiritual Survival. I'm your host, Randy Brown. And uh, I have as a, a guest this week, Phil Wright. Um, he's, a, he's been a patriarch in the church, and he's a, a well-known author. And uh, we would love to learn from some of his experiences, both as a patriarch and as an author, and uh, some of his personal experiences around uh, his feelings of our need to prepare spiritually for these things that are going to precede the second coming. So, Phil, welcome. Thank Thanks, you for Randy. Your- Appreciate being here. I look forward to it. So, uh, if you wouldn't mind, uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit about uh, your time as a patriarch. Now, when you were a patriarch, you were in Utah. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, my wife served as my scribe. We 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 actually raised our seven kids in Bountiful for about 22 years. And then a few years ago, the Lord told us to move to Utah County, uh, something we just thought we would never do. And we ended up building a home up on the hill in Saratoga Springs. And we were there for about three years. And shortly after we moved in is when COVID hit. And uh, we all know the difficulties that that brought. Um, But during that time, I was called to be a stake patriarch. And again, my wife was called to be my scribe. And I've, I've had, you know, different callings in the church. I I've had experiences to teach as a gospel doctrine teacher. I've served in presidencies. I even taught seminary, which to me was the most amazing thing I ever did. But none of it compared to hearing the Lord's voice every single week as I was uh, giving blessings mostly to young people, quite a few adults, but mostly young people. And uh, my wife and I, all week long, we would just be on a cloud. The spirit was so wonderful in our home. And our kids had, at this time we built our house, our kids had were grown and had moved away and were married. So it was just the two of us. But we had experiences of, of having, uh, doing blessings every single week and sometimes several a week. Um, there was a time during COVID when I was giving blessings for three different stakes uh, because other patriarchs, um, I'm assuming much older than me, were nervous about COVID. And what a blessing it was for my wife and I, because we had people coming into our home every single week, again, sometimes several in a week. We never got sick. We never got COVID. And I only say that because I know that the Lord blessed us to be able to serve in that calling and to make sure that young people had an opportunity to know how much Heavenly Father loves them, who they are, and their value to Him. So we had just amazing experiences. Um, and it was something that we just assumed we would, uh, you know, a, a position in the church we would have for the rest of our lives. And when you become a patriarch, you're ordained, basically the patriarchal priesthood, you're ordained, and that's an office in the priesthood. So I will always be a patriarch wherever I live. Um, but it's at the I serve at the uh, direction of a stake president. So in, in Utah, I served under the stake president of Saratoga Springs North Stake. We moved to Missouri last April, and I'm not currently serving as a patriarch. However, I have had some wonderful experiences of being able to give blessings to some of my grandchildren since we've been here. So that's kind of my introduction as being a patriarch. Well, you and I share a couple things in common. Uh, number one, um, my my wife and I have felt impressed a couple of times 
um, during our years of marriage to move, <laughs> to take our family and move to certain locations. And, uh, you know, there just there are things that couldn't have happened in our lives had we not have followed that prompting. And so I think that's really important, you know, for one is that it helps us learn to, uh, it helped us learn how to hear the voice of the Lord and to recognize it. And I think that's going to be very vital in, in, you know, preparing ourselves spiritually for yeah. things that lie ahead in the months and, and years ahead. Um, and uh, do you feel like, Maybe that prompting to move to Saratoga Springs, uh, you know, was was part of the Lord putting you in the right place at the right time for this calling. Absolutely, um, it's really interesting because when the state president, uh, we had moved in our house when our house was completed, we moved in, and, and about two weeks later, we were contacted by the state president who asked if he could come visit us, and we said, of course. And I remember telling my wife, "Wow, this is wonderful!" And this stake, the stake president comes and introduces himself to people. I was not thinking clearly here. Never occurred to me that it had anything to do with a calling. But he came to our home and spent almost two hours. And near the end of that, it was a wonderful experience. But near the end of that time with him, I realized he was asking us very deep and somewhat personal questions about our faith in the Savior, our belief in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it wasn't until he was ready to leave that it finally dawned on me that it was kind of an interview, getting to find out who we were. And right before he left, he said, uh, so, you know, if you don't hear from me in the next couple of weeks, just go about your life. Everything is normal. And that's when I realized something was happening. So we said goodbye and he left. And then that's about when COVID really started picking up and the churches, as you remember, were having a hard time trying to figure out, do we close? Do we stay open? And eventually our building started closing. So we didn't hear from uh, the state president for about a month. And I had totally forgotten about it. And then uh, one day we get a call on a Saturday evening from the state executive secretary asking if we could meet with the state president the following Sunday. And that's when it occurred to me that something was up. And I remember looking at my wife, I looked at her and I said, Sean, I am pretty confident you're going to be called maybe to be a, a stake relief society president or young women or primary or something. I was convinced that my wife, um, who's just an absolute amazing, wonderful person, I was convinced that this was for her. So we meet with the state president, the two of us, and we talked for a few minutes. And then he looked at my wife and he said, Sister Wright, would you mind giving me just a few minutes to give your husband a worthiness interview? And the moment he said that, um, I got nervous. Uh, we, we built in a brand new neighborhood, and I knew that they were soon going to be splitting the ward. And I've never been a bishop, and I was nervous. I'm thinking, first of all, I'm, I'm just too old to be a bishop. Um, they call younger younger guys now, you know. Um, so when my wife left and he started talking with me, it was by far the most deep interview I've ever had, worthiness interview I've ever had. And the spirit was so powerful. And while my wife was sitting out in the lobby, she had kind of a, uh, not a vision, she had a something appear in her mind that she knew exactly what the calling was. So then he brought my wife back in and the three of us are sitting talking and he looked at me and said, Brother Wright, oh, I didn't realize I was gonna get emotional with this. <laughs> he said, Brother Wright, um, I've done a lot of fasting and praying and the Lord has made it clear to me that he wants you to be a patriarch in our stake. Uh, this Sorry, it's all coming back to me. It's kind of hitting me. Um, and my sweet wife, with tears in her eyes, said, President, as I was sitting in the lobby, I saw the word patriarch, and I knew the Lord gave me a confirmation that Phil would be called as a patriarch. And, of course, she was called as my scribe. So we both received this confirmation, and I was, I was a little nervous. I said, Bishop, do I look that old? <laughs> or President, do I look that old? I figure you have the white hair. And he kind of smiled and... And I said, you know, I've 
I've never been a bishop. I've never been in a bishopric. I've never been on a high council. I've never been in a state presidency. Are you sure you got the right person? And he smiled and said, the Lord doesn't make mistakes. I know this is uh, what the Lord wants. And of course, I accepted uh, I accepted that. And uh, then I figured he was going to sign me up for some class to learn how to be a patriarch. There are no classes to be a patriarch. And then I figured there'd be a manual. There are no manuals. He gave me a pamphlet that had four pages with some basic instruction. And then he handed me some books uh, about patriarchal blessings. And he said, you know, read this stuff and call me in a couple weeks and, and let me know when you think you're going to be ready. So I went home. Um, I, I need to admit, I, a few days later, I was ordained by the state president. But I went home that Sunday and read all the books and read through the pamphlet. And a couple days later, I told my wife, I said, I, I guess I'm ready. So I called the state president even before the following Sunday and said, President, I think I'm ready. <laughs> he said, you're ready now to give a blessing? I said, it's either now or never. Um, so I was ordained a few days later. And then the very next Sunday, um, gave my first blessing and I, you know, I could talk for hours. I won't, but I could talk for hours about some of the amazing experiences, primarily with the young people that I had the opportunity to give blessings to. Um, but it was just uh, an incredible time in our lives. And again, we assumed that we would spend the rest of our lives in our new home uh, as patriarch and scribe. But that didn't happen because we're no longer living in Saratoga Springs. Yeah. Well, I think that's so valuable to the listeners. I, I feel like we're living in a time where we need to be so sensitive to these promptings of the of the spirit. And uh, they're going to be so vital to our spiritual survival. And uh, yeah, I mean, great example. I when when we felt the promptings to move here to Bountiful, Utah from Arizona, you know, one of the really important things is we we felt prompted to move into the same stake as my father-in-law, who's our stake patriarch. And so all of our all of our kids, except our oldest, have been able to uh, receive patriarchal blessings by their grandfather. Our oldest received his down in Arizona before we moved here. But, but I, yeah, I just, I've had so many promptings like that in my life and I know how vital they are. And so yeah, heeding them is so important. Um, as we're talking about that, uh, so you, you obviously felt prompted to leave Saratoga Springs after a while and um, tell tell the audience <laughs> where you live now and the significance of that place and how you, how yeah. prompted you there. Yeah, we we live in a town. Actually, it's called a village because there's only 130 people here. So technically, it's not even a town. It's called a village um, of Jameson, Missouri which is the location of Adam on the Almond. So we're about three and a half minutes directly across some beautiful hills and fields from Adam on the Almond. I have uh, a real good friend, Russell Butler, and his wife, Jan, who just have recently received a mission call to Adam on the Almond. I know them personally. <coughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wonderful people. They're coming out, I think, in April. Yeah. So uh, I, I've told on this podcast many times uh, the experience my wife and I had of in 2020 of, of I can't describe it as anything better than just an awakening to um, our closeness to the, the second coming and, and the uh, urgency <laughs> to take unprecedented measures to prepare for the events preceding the second coming. Um, and, uh, in a way I felt sort of a calling to help people wake up and prepare. And that I think was a big part of feeling called. I was in the temple when I had this strong, uh, powerful impression to begin sharing my testimony online, mm -hmm. which I was really uncomfortable with. <laughs> and, uh, you know, seven months ago, we, we started this little podcast and, and uh, we're, we're uh, feeling impressed every week with things we can we can share with people to help them uh, 
prepare. Um, how has your calling as a, as a patriarch, the impressions you've had to, to move to Adam on Diamond, how has this uh, um, been impacted by your understanding of where we are in, in yeah. time? Well, one of the first things that I experienced, and, and when I say I, I have to include my wife because yeah. As my scribe, I had her attend every blessing. Um, not all patriarchs do it that way, but you can, and I did. Uh, she attended every blessing. We would record the blessings, and then afterwards she would transcribe them, and we would complete them and then get them out to the youth or the people who I'd given the blessing to. Um, <clears throat> so when I say I, I'm speaking for my wife as well. I think the biggest um, eye opener for me in giving these patriarchal blessings is uh, recognizing how much Heavenly Father knows his children individually and intimately. Um, every blessing was very unique to the individual. There were certain themes because there are themes in, in our lives right now that are happening, we're preparing for the second coming of the Savior. And anybody who pays attention to our amazing prophet, he pleads with us constantly, not just every six months at conference, but constantly pleads with us to be prepared spiritually because the second coming is very, very close. So giving blessings to the every week and hearing the types of things that Heavenly Father was sharing with those receiving their blessing was so overwhelming for me in the beginning because I was hearing things that I had prior to becoming a patriarch, I was hearing things in these blessings that I was I hadn't paid much attention to in life before, such as timing. Now the Lord has not told me when he's coming back. I doubt he's told you, Randy. He's probably told a couple of people, and I can think of one who probably knows, but I, I don't know when he's coming. But what I do know that I didn't know before becoming a patriarch is that his coming is not decades and decades away. Those who claim that it's going to be 15, 20, or 30 or more years before he comes they remind me of those in the Book of Mormon who did not believe Jesus Christ was going to be born. And they, as you remember, they were ready to kill all of the believers. And then at the very last moment, the sign happens and Christ comes. I feel like we're kind of there today with members of the church, good people who believe that Christ will come again, but they don't believe it could possibly happen either in their lifetime or in, in a short period of time of a decade or so. Most members of the church just don't want to go there. We have adult children who are raising their children. And they kind of have some blinders on. I don't say that to be negative because they're wonderful and they're doing their best to raise their children in the gospel, but it's like they don't want to see what's happening around them because they've got preteens and teenagers and they just want them to live a normal life. And I understand that, but I think we need to take these blinders and move them and recognize everything that's happening around us because the events that are going to precede the second coming of the Savior are going to be very, very difficult, more difficult than anything we've ever experienced. And if you read the stories of the saints, of the pioneers of what they went through, being, being, uh, forced out from one place to another, one state to another. And the horrible experiences they had on the plains and the death and uh, that, I hate to say it, but that is going to pale comparison to what is on the horizon for us. And so many times I'll read stories of the pioneers and I'll think, I'll say, thank you, Lord, that I wasn't born in their day. But... Mm. They're probably up there thanking the Lord that they're not living in our day because things are going to get really bad. And that's why I think when our prophet constantly says we have to have a testimony of Jesus Christ, we have to have that confirmation from the Holy Ghost 
that we know the gospel is true. And if we don't have that, we won't survive the coming days. So my next are, you know, my next podcast is going to be about uh, how this this is just my way of seeing it that tribulations are necessary and they will accompany miracles. Yes. Without the tribulations, we will not develop the faith. We will not develop the priesthood power to to participate in these miracles that are going to be coming. And, you know, just as we're going to see the greatest miracles the world has ever seen, we're going to see tribulations like the world has never seen. And they, they, they go hand in hand. And the tribulations, although they'll be they'll be difficult, they're essential to help yes. us to ascend to a spiritual level where we can receive the the power of God in great glory as uh, Nephi saw in his vision. Yes. Um, and so, yeah, I just believe they go hand in hand and, and uh, we need to brace ourselves. And so that's, that's part of my uh, desire in having these podcasts is to wake people up um, to see some of the things in the scriptures. Yeah. We pass over like the things that Isaiah talks about it are written for our day. The Book of Mormon is just full of types written for our day to prepare us and warn us. And uh, so thank you. Thank you for saying that. Um, you know, when I was uh, kind of going through my wake up experience in 2020, one of the first people that the Lord kind of led me to was Michael Rush. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> I know that you're either friends with or tied into Michael somehow. Can you tell he's, us a little bit about a, he's that? He's a dear friend. He and his wife, Amy, are personal friends of Sean and I. And, well, I, I, I had no idea I was going to get all emotional talking about these things. Um, we love it. Get emotional. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's the spirit. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was introduced to Michael Rush about three years ago. Uh, I won't go into all the details, but... Um, a, a dear friend of mine who has been a friend of mine for over 30 years, um, his, uh, the attorney who works for the company that my friend is the executive director for, it's a charity, his attorney is the uncle of Michael Rush. And his attorney told my friend Rick Nelson, is his name, told Rick, hey, I've got this book I want you to read. My, my nephew wrote it, and I just wanted to get your thoughts on it. So we handed him... Um, the first version of Michael Rush's book, A Remnant Shall Return. And we've since joked with Mike that there's the red album and the white album. <laughs> what you see now is the red album. The white album didn't have the last few chapters in it. And that's what he gave my friend to read. And I remember, um, so Rick read the book and he reads everything. And then uh, he called me and invited me to a fireside that Michael Rush was going to be doing in Utah, I think in Draper or Sandy. And my wife and I were not available that night, so we didn't make it. So later on, my friend Rick gave me this book. And no joke, it was like, it was like this wide. And reading it was like a typewriter. You had to go like this. And the font was so tiny, I thought... I can't read this. It's going to hurt my neck. I, oh, <laughs> someone needs to have help this guy edit this thing. So I, I knew that it must have been wonderful stuff, but I didn't take the time to read it. Well, shortly after that, um, our Michael Rush's uncle, his name is Bob. Bob told Rick that, and I got to get the story right, that Mike was going to be back in Utah and, uh, if Mike wanted, if Rick wanted to meet him. So Rick said, yeah, that would be great. So Rick actually called Michael Rush and told him about me, that I was a friend of his, uh, that I was a patriarch. And I've, I've had throughout my life, I've had quite a few dreams. Um, some people refer to them as visions of some of the difficulties that will happen in the last days, primarily things that would happen in Utah, some horrific events. So Mike was interested in meeting me. So I got a call from Michael Rush one day out of the blue, and he introduced himself. And I said, yeah, my friend Rick told me about you, and Bob says you're a great guy. And he said, Phil, I'd really like to meet you. And I said, well, that would be great. So I invited him to my home. And he came in and sat in our front room for about 20 minutes. My wife and I were talking with him. And then my wife had some things to do. And I said, well, Mike, come on into my office. Let's talk. 
And we spent almost four hours, and it was one of the most amazing experiences of my life, discovering the connection that we had. It was as though we had known each other forever. And uh, I can't go into the details of what we talked about, but I can say that uh, we both received a powerful spiritual witness that we were meant to meet. And uh, shortly after that meeting, um, Michael talked with another friend of his down in Spring City and said, I want you to meet this guy that I just met, but I can't give you his name or tell you anything about him because he hasn't told me it's okay to. But I'd like to set up a meeting with, with you, this guy in Spring City, me, my friend, my uncle, and another gentleman who the uh, book, um, going blank, whose visions were used in a very popular LDS book, mm -hmm. Visions of Glory. So he told this person about me, but he didn't give me my name. And he said, I'm going to call my friend and see if he'd be willing to join us in this meeting. So um, when he hung up, within 10 minutes, this gentleman he'd been speaking to called him back and said, I know who the guy is. And he says, what do you mean you know who he is? He goes, his name is Phil Wright. And Mike said, how did you find that out? And he goes, well, I just made a few phone calls. You told me he was a patriarch. He used to be involved in Utah politics. He lived in Utah. He goes, I had a couple of connections. So he found out who I was. Well, about two weeks later, we all go to this meeting and we met in West Bountiful at the business of my friend Rick. <clears throat> and we sat in the conference room. So it's me, Rick, Bob, Michael Rush, this other gentleman from uh, Spring City, and then the gentleman known as Spencer in the book Visions of Glory. And we met at 8.30 that morning, and we didn't leave that conference room until 6.30 that evening. It was um, one of the most amazing spiritual experiences of my life. And as we were leaving the meeting, that's when I realized um, that I needed to write a new book, something totally different. And I invited my friend Rick Nelson to help me write the book. And it was because of meeting Mike Rush and the gentleman known as Spencer um, and others that I realized, you know, you're talking about how the Lord has encouraged you to do these podcasts, to share your testimony. I think that he's, He's creating this interest throughout the world of people who love the Lord, and he's encouraging them to share their testimony, whether it's through what we're doing now, whether it's through music or the written word, whatever their talents are, the Lord is gathering people throughout the world. And I'm not just talking people who have the restored gospel in their life. I'm talking people who love Jesus Christ and can bear testimony of him. So it's happening throughout the world. For me, I've written several books, and the Lord told me uh, I'd had these new connections because I need to write a new type of book that will appeal to a broader audience. And that's what ended up happening. And through that, uh, Mike and I have just become dear friends. I remember telling him once, okay, Mike, I'm not old enough to be your dad, but I could be your big brother. <laughs> Well, I imagine you and I are about the same age, so I I understand that. Um, thanks for sharing that. That that's incredible. Um, one of the experiences I have had uh, since I've begun this podcast is a lot of people reaching out to me, <laughs> and um, one of the trends I have seen that is um, it's very sacred, actually. Um, people reaching out to me sharing dreams and visions and and even their children having dreams and visions and i think you know like like president nelson says the greatest miracles the world has ever seen you know are are going to happen between now and the lord's uh, coming in glory 
And uh, in the last conference, I, I believe it was the last conference, he ended up by saying the, the power of God in great glory is already coming upon the saints. And there's also mm -hmm. prophecy that in the last days, your children shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. And, and Randy, we are seeing that all over the world. Not again, not just in our in our church community, but righteous believers in Christ throughout the world are having dreams and visions, and they're all leading to the second coming of Jesus Christ. I didn't mean to cut you off, but you no, know, just no, I, dead. You know, uh, one of the the things I've struggled a little bit with is as these people approach me. Um, some of me, some of them have wanted me to share them on the podcast, and I, I, I've struggled with that because these things are so sacred that if you know, just throwing it out there to the whole world is is a, an appropriate thing to do. But I, maybe at some point there will be some of that, um, and uh, you know, I can testify that I also have been having some sacred dreams and experiences in the temple that uh, I won't share at this time, <laughs> but uh, leads me to believe that some of these, you know, gives me a, a pretty strong assurance that some of these people like Spencer and visions of glory, you know, those experiences actually are of God and are true. And, and those that attack them, I think, uh, ought to maybe take a deep dive into the book of Isaiah. <laughs> And uh, a deeper dive yeah. into Mormon, and um, anyway, I'll just leave it at that. But yeah, unfortunately, we have a lot of religious zealots in the church today who think that if it if they don't hear it every six months from the brethren, it can't be true. But even our prophet, I, no, I think there was a wonderful talk recently by Elder Bednar, and I can't think of what it was, but it was just recently, the last six months or so. He was giving a talk somewhere and he talked about how if you're expecting to hear from the Lord every six months and that's the volume of your preparation, you're not going to be prepared. You know, even our prophet is constantly saying that we need to receive personal revelation. He's not talking about revelation that's for the whole church. He's talking about personal revelation for us and those within our stewardship. A bishop can receive personal revelation for his ward. A father who is the patriarch of his family or a grandfather can receive personal revelation for his posterity. And people in the church, so many people in the church are afraid of that. They don't realize that's that's your responsibility. And, and I'm going to say also for women, a matriarch in her home can receive personal revelation for her family. This isn't just a, a male thing. It's all of God's children, all of his children have the right to receive personal revelation from him. And, and oftentimes that is for their <clears throat> stewardship. It's for their family, their loved ones. So I understand what you're saying. You know, if someone receives a vision or something, they have to be very careful. Yeah, about what they do with that and going on a podcast and sharing that may not be the right <laughs> thing to do. Yeah. So I, you know, I applaud you for following the spirit to be careful about those that you do bring on, because as you know, Randy, there are tons and tons of LDS podcasts now. They're everywhere, and I'm sure most of them are wonderful, but some have actually started leading people away from the church. And that's kind of scary. So yeah. you have an important thing that you're doing, and obviously you need to continue to follow the Spirit to make sure that you're doing things the way the Lord wants you to do it. Yeah, one of the most powerful things for me and that, that President Nelson has, uh, has said since he's become the prophet is seek to be taught by the Lord himself. And so when I when I hear other people's dreams and visions or you know that's I feel like I have to go and get confirmation myself that he will he will answer things that I ask um and I you know I believe that the the main purpose of the church is to get us through the doors of the temple yeah I'm not going and we can be taught in the temple things that won't be discussed over the pulpit 
things yep. like being general conference. Yep. And so there's a there's a whole realm of revelation that, and uh, knowledge that can be opened up to us in our own personal relationships with the Father and the Son that is, is not <laughs> going to be taught in a Sunday school class. And it's, it's going to be taught in our homes. I mean, was it 2018 when President Nelson introduced the Come Follow Me program? Sounds right, yeah. I, think, I mean, think about how inspired, how prophetic that was. Two years later, our churches are closed down. Two years later, we cannot even attend our churches and, and congregate with one another and share our testimonies in sacrament or, or share our testimonies during Sunday school. Two years after our prophet of God received a revelation and introduced a program to teach and encourage us to teach our families at home, we were forced to do that. I think that is probably the best thing that happened from COVID. Um, but the adversary took advantage of that because a lot of people didn't teach their families at home, and many of those people have now left the church. Um, but I think of things like that, how prophetic that was. And it and the prophet has echoed that ever since about receiving personal revelation and teaching from within your home. I had a, a guest on my podcast probably a few months ago, Todd McLaughlin. I know Todd. <clears throat> yeah, Todd talked about, uh, we talked about the spirit of prophecy and and how you don't see that term in the Bible, except for one time in the book of Revelation, where it talks about the testimony of Christ is the spirit of revelation. And, and uh, but it's throughout the Book of Mormon, T you know, type in spirit of prophecy and search the Book of Mormon. And uh, the Book of Mormon is this book that's a pattern for how, how we can attain that spirit of prophecy for ourselves and how we can ascend spiritually. You know, the, all the main characters in the Book of Mormon. Um, entered the presence of the Lord in, in mortality. <laughs> and uh, so there's there's so much. Um, trying to remember, uh, Neil A. Maxwell said, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, you know, for those with eyes to see, it becomes evident that the Lord is giving away the secrets of the universe. I think Michael Rush might have qu quoted that. Uh, that sounds familiar, yeah. Yeah. Well, think about this. Why would our Father in Heaven withhold anything from us? Yeah. If we ask, you know, and, and how how are we able to approach our Father in Heaven through humility and righteousness? If we're humble and we're striving to be righteous, that's, that's when we approach Him, and that's when He gives us the answers to our prayers. He doesn't always give us exactly what we're asking. You know, as a parent, you're not going to give your 14-year-old a car um, unless you live in Idaho, I guess, for certain parts of the country where they can drive. But I'm just saying, as a parent, you know what your children can handle and what they can't. And, you you know, you teach them line upon line one thing at a time. Our Father in Heaven is no different. He's, he's willing and able and wants to give us everything. But we have to be at the point in our lives where we're ready to receive it. And most of those things, um, many of those things happen in the temple, as you mentioned. They happen in sacred and holy places. But I also believe that our homes should be sacred and holy places so that we can also receive those types of answers to our prayers, personal revelation, wherever we happen to be, not just in the temple. Um, you know, you and I were talking, I think, before the podcast a little bit, um, kind of about how we ended up in Missouri. Did yeah. You want to talk about that a little bit. Yeah, let's, let's do that. Um, as I mentioned before, being a patriarch was just a, a wonderful experience. Um, uh, I've also had the experience to give some patriarchal blessings to some of my grandchildren, and that has been amazing. So we just figured we would be in the Saratoga Springs North Stake for the rest of our lives with these wonderful callings we had. I had a business trip uh, in in uh, Phoenix. I was gone for a week and I flew out of the Provo Airport and I flew back into Provo. And I remember getting into my car, it was on a Friday and I was headed home. And shortly after I got on the freeway, 
I just started feeling very overwhelmed and very emotional. It was feelings that I'd never experienced. And I was kind of nervous thinking, okay, what's going on in my, what is, what is happening? Why am I feeling this way? And then a couple moments later, I heard very audibly, you need to sell your home and everything you can as soon as possible and move to Missouri. And I heard this voice and I thought, I, I have seven children here. We had 14 grandchildren. I, I can't do that. A couple moments later, I heard the exact same voice telling me the exact same thing again. Now I knew that it was coming from my Father in Heaven, but I still didn't want to hear it because I couldn't imagine leaving my family and all those that I loved behind. And it was really, really hard. And I said, Lord, can I move to Spring City or St. George? And I'm trying to find a place closer. And then I heard, you will be blessed wherever you go. But if you don't go where I'm asking you to go, you will forfeit the blessings you could have received. And then I heard the voice again say for the third time, you need to sell your home and everything you can as soon as possible and move to Missouri. And I thought, okay, well, the Lord stole me three times. And uh, the rest of the drive home is maybe a 20 minute drive. I get home and I'm thinking, how am I going to tell Sean? How am I going to break the news to her? And as I'm walking in the house, she has her bags packed walking out. I'd forgotten that she was going on a three day weekend with one of our daughters and a couple of her girlfriends and all I could do was give her a kiss and hug and say goodbye so for the next three days I'm home by myself kind of stewing a little bit about this and wrestling with the Lord a little bit about this three days later Sean gets home and I remember I just went out to the driveway and I got in the car and I sat in the car with her before she even walked in the house and I said I need to share something with you I don't know how you're going to take this, but we both have to be on the same page. And I told her what happened. And she looked at me and she said, I will go and do what the Lord wants. And I remember looking at her and saying, look at you. I wrestled with the Lord for three days. And I tell you this, and the first words out of your mouth is I'll go and do what the Lord wants. She had received a powerful confirmation that it's what we needed to do. So it took us uh, about three weeks to get our affairs in order. We put our house on the market, started giving away furniture and things. And uh, the very next day we got an offer on our house and it kind of fell apart. The realtors were arguing back and forth and nothing came of it. A couple of days later, interest rates went up for the first time in years. And all of a sudden the market just stopped. Everything became stagnant for about a month. Nothing was selling. Was selling. And then one day the Lord said, take your house off the market. And I said, but Lord, you, you told us to do this. But I said, okay. So we took our house off the market. And then a few months later, <clears throat> my mother who lives in Alabama was turning 85. She lives by herself. And I told my wife, I don't want her to celebrate her 85th birthday alone. Let's, let's go out and be with her for a week. And I said, actually, Let's drive to Missouri and then fly from Missouri to, to Georgia, and then we'll drive to Alabama. So that's what we did. And we drove out here. A friend of ours uh, bought a home in Adam on Dahman. He doesn't live here, but and he let us stay in the home for a, a few days. So we had this amazing experience being here and another confirmation. That's where the Lord wanted us to be. So then we flew to Georgia. We were there for about a week with my mom. We actually drove up to North Carolina and spent several days with Mike and Amy Rush. And then we drove or flew back to Missouri. And then we got stuck in Missouri for a week because of all the snowstorms last year. We couldn't drive back. And as we were here one day, the Lord said, you need to go home. This is the middle of February. You need to go home and put your house back on the market. And I thought, it houses aren't selling in the winter in Utah, especially with all these snowstorms. But he told me to do it. And then he told me exactly what I needed to list the home for. 
So we called the real estate agent where our listing was previously. And she's not an active member of the church. And we told her, uh, we know we need to list it as soon as we get home. And uh, she said, great, I'll do a market analysis. And she says, now you realize the values have dropped a bit since you had it on the market a few months ago. I said, I understand, no, no problem. So we got home. And the day after we got home, she uh, met us on a Monday. And she's sitting at our kitchen table and she has this booklet, her market analysis, and she was so nervous. And before she opened it, I looked at her and I said, hey, I'm going to settle your fears right now. I already know the values are less, but I also know the exact number that we need to list the home for. And then her eyes got really big and nervous. And I told her the number. Then she opened her market analysis and held it up. And that was the exact number that she had on her market analysis. Oh, my heavens. So we put our house on the market that Friday, a few days later, and sold it two days later for full price. And the buyers paid all their closing costs. Uh, it, it was it was amazing. So what we learned from that, Randy, not only do we have to be willing to hear the, there's kind of some tests. The first test is, are you willing to hear the voice of the Lord, which we were, and we put our house on the market, but it didn't sell. But the second part is, now that you're willing to hear the Lord, will you hear him when his timing is right? And we did. And it's so miraculous to me how everything worked out. He first wanted to make sure we're willing, and then he was going to let us know when to sell it. And we sold the house, and uh, within a month later, we were here in Adam on Dom and in Missouri. And it's been an incredible experience every single day since we've been here. It's just been amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that sacred those sacred experiences. Um, I know we were going to uh, try to talk about... Uh, some other things from your uh, presentation that you made to your stake, but we may have to save that for a second. <laughs> <laughs> do that. We can uh, the do spirit that. directed us so much in this conversation that uh, we may have to save that for a, a, another time if you'd be willing to come back. So, of course, of course, you know we've been talking about the prophet, and and there's a couple of things I did want to share that were in my presentation. I'll just kind of refer to them. It was in October of 2022. You might remember when. President Nelson said, in coming days, we will see the greatest manifestations of the Savior's power that the world has ever seen. When I heard that, and I'm sure you remember hearing that too, I remember thinking, wow, the greatest manifestations of the Savior's power? What could be greater than his resurrection? I mean, that was his power. He had the power to resurrect himself. What could we witness that would be greater than that in the coming days? And I truly believe it will be his return and the events that take place prior to his return. We're going to witness some horrible atrocities, Randy, but we're also going to witness some amazing personal miracles in our lives when we and our loved ones are able to uh, lift the shield of faith and, and, and wield the sword of truth and righteousness and defending our families and loved ones against the adversary and against those who would do us harm. We're going to see our temples desecrated. We're going to see our churches taken over. We're, we're going to see our, our, our beloved apostles and prophets probably in hiding for a time because of all of the atrocities that will happen in this country. And we will see the Antichrist in our country, but then we will see some miraculous events. Just imagine when the lost tribes come, and we're told that that event is going to be greater than the parting of the Red Sea. So I picture the same way Michael Rush does. That's going to be a miraculous event that happens in this country to redeem our church, our temples, our homes, and our families. Those are going to be some of the greatest manifestations that the Savior has ever done. And I believe, Randy, that we will be able to witness those things much, much sooner than most people can imagine. Thank you for being with us on the Spiritual Survival Podcast.